thank you, thank you, thank you so much for inviting me to your beautiful country uh, to talk a bit about Euroflorist and what we've done over the last 21 years. And um, as I say, it's, it's quite cool. I mean, we've been doing this for 21 years and, and we still see that we have so far to go. Trying to... All right. No? There we go. Thanks. Uh, so a little bit uh, quick about me. I'd like to introduce myself. Uh, as you heard, I'm Laszlo Varga. I'm the CEO of Euroflorist. I've been the CEO since last year. Uh, I've been with the company since 2009. And I really like all things digital. I, I wrote my first website in Notepad. Um, has anyone here written a website in Notepad back in the 90s? It was a lot of fun. Um, really HTML. Uh, and about that's where my coding stopped and my more passion about e-commerce and digital communication really grew. Uh, I started working with e-commerce in 2006, uh, doing newsletters for a company, and, and really the communication there. That was a fantastic thing. I, I could communicate to, to thousands, hundreds of thousands of people and, and see immediately what happened if I changed a word or, or had a different offer. And, and this was really cool to me. It was, uh, if, you, if you have a store, maybe you have a thousand a thousands visitors coming in in one day, and, and, and your communication with them is depending on what you have in your store. But if you have a website, you have people from all over the world who are uh, coming instantaneously, but might leave as soon also. Um, I love to kayak. I put it in there because in a couple of weeks you have the Olympics in Rio. I know it's a bit of a controversy here in Brazil, but I'm happy because I have two of my athletes competing in kayaking, so I'm really hoping for the best for them. So, Euroflorist. Trying to, do I have to? There we go. Euroflorist, uh, founded in 1982. Uh, we have been doing e-commerce for 21 years. Uh, we exist in 12 countries in Europe, and those are the ones in green. Uh, we have a turnover of about 100 million, 150 million US dollars, and we do about 2.3 million smiles. That's what we call them. We deliver 2.3 million smiles per year, and do that with 196 colleagues. And this is why we exist. We exist to help our customers make their friends, family, colleagues, and loved ones feel happy, noticed, and remembered, uh, and to make our florist lives easier and more profitable. This is what drives us. This is, as you see, there's nothing there about the delivery of flowers or anything like that, because that's not why we exist. We, we exist for that, that reason there that you see. I mean, the flowers is a method of doing that, but the smile is, is, is what it's all about. And it's, it's a quite fascinating. So I, I'm just going to briefly tell you how the service works if, you've, if you don't know about flower delivery. And this is flower delivery in, in Europe. It started about 100 years ago in Germany. Uh, now I'm using one of our countries as an example. But you walked into a local florist. At the local flor florist, you, you, you might have had a sister in Paris and you wanted, it's her birthday, you couldn't visit her. So you ask the florist, okay, my sister in Paris, these are her details, could you please send her flowers? Then the florist, this is about maybe 30, 40 years ago, used the fax machine. Today, they use a computer, send it in to the network, and this is your florist. This is who we are in the whole delivery chain system. We, we don't own any stock, we don't own any flowers, we don't own any florists. We handle the order, we handle the smile. And in our network, we have a florist, this florist in Paris, we send them the order, we handle all the money and transfer it, and then that florist delivers it. So it's kind of like a, a back, a, it's an analog 3D printer. So you order something in one location and the same thing is delivered in another location. That's quite cool. Uh, and, and we solved the last mile delivery. I know that's a big challenge for a lot of e-commerce companies is how do you solve the last mile delivery? How do you solve home delivery? For us, that's how we started. Basically, that's what our service was. 
It was home delivery of a product. And in 1995, something really cool happened. We're an innovative company. Our founder, Peto Jungbeck, he saw that, all right, this internet, it might be something, you know? People sitting on their computers, they might use it to, to actually do other things than chat and, uh, and send email. They, they might start shopping. So we launched our first website in Sweden in 1995. And we still have people at the company working who was there and built the website. And they, they told me, they, they were sitting the first couple of months, they were just sitting with, with the screens, one screen separately for the order um, statistics to see, okay, one order today, cool. And then two days, no, nothing, and then, ah, another order. And it's even more cool to think about that I'm working for a company that did this before Google, before eBay. Amazon came before us, but I've heard somewhere, I haven't had it verified, but we are one of the first 100 companies doing e-commerce in the world. And that is cool. And we, as I mentioned, innovation has been in our DNA, uh, and so is profitable growth. It's, it's an entrepreneur-driven company, and since the start, it's always been about, okay, we need to make money. That's, that's what companies are about. I mean, how do you otherwise pay salaries? We need to make money, and it's also a way of getting some sort of recognition from the customer that the service you're offering is good. If you don't have to pay more than what it costs to get the customer, then obviously you're providing a good service. In the long term, if you're paying more than the value of the customer, you will not be able to succeed and thrive. And for us, this is our online volume since the start. As you see, it was quite slow for the first five years. Nothing really happened. And then all of a sudden it started, 2000, after the dot-com bubble, it started growing and, and steadily up until 2010. And the big jump, 2010, was when we acquired uh, UK. That was the 12th market we went into. Uh, so between 2008 and 2010, we were standing a bit still. And that, we started thinking about, okay, we're an innovative company, but What's happening? Why aren't we growing? The e-commerce in general, general is growing around us, but we're standing still. So I started thinking and, and noticed that we, have, we, we were an entrepreneurial and profitable company, and this was our e-commerce team. And many of you might recognize this. This is what it looks like when you start with e-commerce. You, you don't have the resources. You don't have maybe a team of hundreds of people. You have a team of maybe three, five, six people. When I started in 2009, we had a team of nine people doing 11 market or 10 markets at that time. So the person who was responsible for the Scandinavian websites also did some affiliate marketing uh, if they were interested for that. If somebody, we had a guy doing the Dutch, Belgian, and German website, he was also doing uh, Google AdWords. And we had a designer who also talked to social media and so on and so on. So it was really a, a nice little family, but we weren't really adapting to our surroundings. And this is one of the things, this was a buzzword uh, in Sweden and in, in Europe in general in e-commerce six years ago is it's not just about being innovative. I mean, innovative is launching new products and services and cool technical features, but it's also about adapting. And this is a quote, it's not Charles Darwin, actually, it's attributed to him, but it's somebody else. But it's not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent, it's the one that's most adaptable to change. Think about the dinosaurs, they were the biggest the rulers, but the environment changed, they died. And, and the, we started thinking about Eurofloors, okay, what are we doing that is not completely adapting to our surroundings. Well, we're not really looking at the customer. We are trying to do a very good, profitable company, but we're treating the whole market of Europe as the same. So we're not adapting to the different countries. Um, Europe is not one country. It's, it's a very diverse country with many different nations. And, and even though we are in Western Europe, it's, it's, it's not, this is stereotypical when, you, when some, some people think about 
Europe and the different countries. So, so Germans, they, they drink a lot of beer and have lederhosen's. The Swedes, they love their royal family, their king. Uh, the French, they're kind of blasé, cool, and drink wine. And, and the British, well, conservative. I, I, tried, I tried to find a good something to, 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 to kind of summarize British, and I didn't want to go on colonial issues. I, I, I wanted to find something that's a bit more fun. And though the similarities, it's a very diverse continent. Uh, and looking at e-commerce, if you try to do one size fits all, these are some of the things that we noticed in our journey when we started looking into, okay, so why isn't what we're doing this in Denmark really successfully, but it's not working in Germany? And when you're a small e-commerce company, that's kind of how you do it. You, you don't have time to look at each individual market. You try it in one place, and if it works, then you just copy-paste everywhere else. And, and that's what we noticed. So, for example, discount codes, UK, massive. Discount codes, everyone there uses discount codes. The biggest channel, the biggest affiliate is a discount code provider. And they're price sensitive. So we started, okay, so we'll use discount codes everywhere. And then in Norway, a super rich country with oil, this was five, six years ago, they didn't use discount codes. So we sent a great newsletter with a big discount code and it actually performed worse than a, just a regular email with a nice picture. And then we're, okay, okay, so we can't do discount cones in Norway. Now we have to do it because they're in an economic recession. But, and then the Germans, it's about trust. Don't be funny. Don't try to be, have funny pictures and promotions. If they don't recognize the brand, if they don't know who you are, they're not going to buy from you and they do not shop during work hours. They're really, really uh, hard workers and wouldn't break that trust of their employer. While, for example, Scandinavians, their favorite time of shopping is from 9 in the morning until 11. That's when they should be working. Germany, the conversion rate just drops. After, when they start working, goes up a bit during lunch, then goes down again. After work hours at 5, 6 o'clock in the evening, it goes up again. Scandinavians, from 9 to 10 to 11, that's when it peaks and then it just drops. That's when Scandinavians start working. Um, looking at Belgians, we didn't have to launch a mobile website since nobody used smartphones in Belgium. It's, so, so looking at these, it's quite interesting. And Danes, Danes are uh, one of the most interesting here because if they find a misspelling on the website, a grammatical error, they'll just leave. They're like, Screw this, I'm going somewhere else. They can't be trustworthy. And what we did then was we hired one manager for each country. And almost instantaneously, it's kind of like magic, it's just immediate return on investment. When we hired a Danish girl to run the Danish website, basically from one month to the other, conversion rate just grew by 10%. Uh, and it's these small things, you couldn't have guessed it. You couldn't have guessed that, it's, that it has that big of an impact. The person who was running the Danish website before was a Swedish person who had lived in Denmark, who knew Danish, but wasn't the Danish person. So she couldn't speak in the tone of voice of the Danes, and she didn't understand the culture. So this was one of the biggest things when we started, okay, let's look at the markets and treat them as individuals. Then the second thing we did to, to try, try to break the standstill was take control, take control and keep competency in-house. We use several different type of agencies for different things and, and there is probably a lot of agencies here today and, and I'm, you're good, you're good at what you do and, and we need you guys, but we need to know what we're doing too. We understand our market the most, we understand our products and our customers the most. So AdWords, we spend right now about $15 million each year on Google AdWords. I would not want to give that money to somebody else to, to play with. We know our customers, so we keep that understanding and knowledge with us. So we took control of AdWords, and what happened? Well, we kept the costs in check, and we grew. We grew quite substantially with our AdWords. 
because we knew what, how to talk, and also the communication between the teams, because the person, when we hired a person, I forgot to say that one, we hired one person in-house to run the AdWords campaigns. Still talking to, to SEA, SEM agencies and consultants, but that's as a sounding board to talk, to get feedback, to develop, because, because we need to get the knowledge from outside. Uh, and, and we still have that. We still, I worked with our AdWords and then I handed it over to another person in the company. And it's really, we have a campaign of right now 800,000 unique search terms that we bid on. And that's something we built over the years. We had one of the world's best agencies. Uh, we think they're one of the world's best because that's one of our board members told us, you have to use these guys. They're the best. They will, they will give you results. And they were so cocky and they said, yeah, we'll help you with your hours. We won't even charge you for it. Uh, if we give you results and uplift, then you have to pay us if you don't. So we benchmarked, we let them run half of our campaigns, we ran the other half, and they couldn't beat us because they don't understand the customer, they don't understand the product, and that's a minuscule thing that actually does, does make a huge difference. And then the third thing we did here was to get the right products for right markets. This is similar to the first one, but it was a big. We hired a whole new team to run the products. And for us, it's, it's an emotional product. It's flowers. It's something you, you send because you can't be there. So I want to send my love for our anniversary, or I want to say happy birthday, or I want to say I'm sorry. And you want to use a unique product for that. And then you think, all right, well, this product, the product you see there, that one is the one that works the best because it's selling tremendously well in Sweden. So let's use that one in all of the countries and promote it. And it didn't work because the countries have very distinct tastes and expectations and price points. So what works in Sweden did not work in Denmark. And we nearly got a whole team, of three people to just focus on this, develop the right products. And, and what you see here is far left, that's Sweden, Monte Carlo, it's the best seller. It's been the best seller for five years. We've done new versions of it, reshot it. But, and we tried it, we, we at the company kind of, I wouldn't say hate it, but we're kind of sick and tired of seeing the same bouquet for the last five years. So we reshoot it and try to challenge it with other, it's still, that's the one that's selling the best. The second one, it's our best seller in the Netherlands. For some reason, it's, it's you, it, we, we take it down from the first spot, the best spot on the first page on the website to the second row, third row, it's still selling the best. Uh, and if you put, add some more colors in there, no, they don't want it. Uh, the one to the furthest right, that's our best seller in France. As you see, there's not that much greenery. They don't want that. They want something passionate. They want something bang for the buck. Um, and that one doesn't work anywhere else. And then the, the one that I haven't mentioned is the UK one. And in the UK, what we noticed is you have to have a lifestyle background. So it's all of these things you have to think about. You, you can't just have a white background. It has to sit on a table or something. That works the best in the UK. So we, this was our team. A little bit, everyone did everything, and we started organizing us to meet and adapt uh, to the needs of the market and our uh, customers. So we, started, we, created, we had a content team, and they focused on content, social media, um, website, on and off website, also doing the newsletters. The traffic team, they looked at traffic. They became the best at looking at how the traffic is coming, what it costs, where to allocate the money, and then the product team, they just really worked on developing the products, uh, having the right products in the right countries. And remember, this is what it looked like when we started this, and this is what happened. That is, I wish I heard like a wow. Because <laughs> it is quite cool. Uh, the general e-commerce market in Europe during that same time grew half as much. And it's not like we did a revolutionary thing where we we found this magic bullet, and that's what created that uplift. It was all of these small things. It was looking at each country, looking at the products, looking at the traffic. And this is where I could have, like, well, you guys know it because you know I have about 30 minutes left, and 
or 25 minutes left, and, and you guys could have said, oh, applaud me and say, hey, good job, good job, you're a florist. And I would have been happy to say that's how it works, but as you know, that's not how, how it is. This is what happened the year afterwards, or, or uh, after these four successful years. It just came to a stop. And we were, we were really having a hard time with this because we had grown our team, we had become smarter, more adaptive. We were innovative. We had, we had launched our website in 95. We have development in-house, which enables us to do it really fast. And we, we built the team with all of these experts. And then all of a sudden, it just stops. And, and why, why? We have our mobile website for five years. Why, why is this happening? And we started looking closer to the numbers. And this happened. The iPhone, first iPhone came in 2007. And then everyone started talking about, now is the time when people will start shopping on their mobile devices wherever they are. They don't have to sit at a desktop. They can be out on the beach and they can do shopping. So you better have a mobile website because HTML enabled mobile phones, that's the future. And that's what they said in 2008, and that's what everyone said in 2009. And in 2010, I think that's when the iPhone 3S or 4 came out. And then people were like, this is now it's happening. And it's kind of like crying wolf. In 2011, we've already had our mobile website for, for uh, over a year. And we had about 2% of our total sales coming from the mobile website. And in 2012, it was 3%. 2013, it was 3.5%, 4%. So we're like, all right, we have a mobile website. 95% eh, or more than 95% of our sales are coming from the desktop. So let's focus on that. That's where, that's where all the customers are. And this is what happened January 2014 to January 2015. We started the year with 5% of our volume coming from mobile devices, of sales coming from mobile devices. And remember, it was 2-3% in 2011. So in three, three and a half years, it basically did not move. And then it jumped up to 10% during Mother's Day. Um, or no, um, yeah, UK Mother's Day in March. And, and then it stabilized around 8 to 10%. And we thought, OK, that's the new plateau. It's, it's moving. It's coming. And then it started going down again after the summer. So people are going back. They're not on holidays where they use their mobile phones. And then all of a sudden, from October to December, it went from 7% from to 30%. And we're like, wow, what happened? And it's not like it was a new mobile phone. It's people finally got used to and trusted to buy from their mobile phones. And we as a company, we spent 5% of our time with the mobile websites and 95% of our time with the desktop websites when the customers are coming 30% from the mobile phone and 70% from the desktop. So of course, our, our, mo our mobile sites weren't really adapting it and, and catering to the customer and their needs. So we really, really needed to understand that it's not just about, it's not just about how innovative and adaptive you are. You have to be fast. The Moore's Law is and probably most of you have heard it, but I'll reiterate it anyways. Moore was a guy in the 60s, computer scientist, doing computer stuff, and he came up with this theory or principle that every two years, the speed of the transistor will double its capacity and half its price. And the transistor is crucial for a computer's processing skills and the capacity of a computer, which means that every two years, exponentially the computer's capacities will de uh, increase and the size of the computer will decrease. So in the end, they will be super small. And if you look at it, the cell phones you have in your pockets today are like so much more sophisticated than the spaceships, than the Apollo 13s that flew out into space. Imagine, imagine sitting in one of these rust buckets and, and it's basically not even as smart as your toaster today. And, and you're going to land on the moon and come back. And this is what's happening in the digital space, the Internet of Things. When a couple of years ago, I think five or six years ago, you started seeing on YouTube funny clips with, with children going up to the TV and swiping the TV. 
and children, you gave them a magazine, and they started swiping on the print pages, and everyone were laughing, like, ha ha, it's so funny how, how silly and stupid they are. No, we are quite silly and stupid who don't understand that that's what's going to happen. They're smart, they see it. They expect it to be like that. And the same thing, if you take it back to a micro perspective, our customers expected to get a really good experience when they came to our mobile site because they've crossed the tipping point. They're there now, and we couldn't cater that. And this is where, uh, remember I talked about, about uh, I, I thought that the toilet would be the smartest thing in your house? It is. A lot of people are talking about smart homes right now, that you will have a refrigerator that will order the groceries for you because the refrigerator will see when you're running out of milk and it will place the order for you. I, I think that's just taking it not enough forwards because the toilet knows what you need. The toilet kind of knows if you're getting sick or if you're running out of nutrients or something like that. So the toilet will communicate and order the right things for you. So in, in 10, 15 years, I imagine my life being like this, that I, I wake up in the morning, I walk out into the kitchen, I don't like cooking food, so uh, I'm one of those guys. But I just go up there, I grab this drink, nutritional drink, that this kind of 3D printer, food 3D printer has created for me, because it's listened to the toilet, it's listened to my bed, it knows Laszlo didn't really sleep that well tonight, so we need to put in some, some caffeine or some other energy boost, and oh, he's running a bit deficient on calcium or iron, so let's put in, and I'll get this tasty milkshake or drink, and I'm on my way to work. And, and, and this kind of blows my mind, actually, because it's, it goes contradictory to what everyone expects from leader in a company, an executive, a CEO. The CEO has all the answers, right? The CEO is at the top of the company pointing fingers and, and encouraging and inspiring and talking about the future. I don't know what's going to happen. Nobody knows. Nobody knows what's going to be up there. And, and the sooner you understand that, the better you're off because then you realize, all right, how, how, how can we figure out what's going to happen in, in five years, two years, three years? Well, let's start listening. Let's start adapting. Let's start looking at the customer. They're talking to us every single day when they're on their website. So start listening to them. The data is there. I just threw in this because I think this one is quite fascinating too, because we're all talking about the big conglomerates coming, Facebook taking over. The reality is actually that companies' life cycles today and lifespan is shorter than ever because the environment is changing so fast and big, giant companies have a really hard time adapting and changing in the right tempo. Today, the expectancy of a company in the Standard & Poor's um, 500 in the U.S. is 12 years. 12 years. It started out 60 years, about uh, 55, 60 years ago. Because the barrier of entry is decreasing. It's becoming easier to come in, and if you're not fast enough listening to what the customer wants, then somebody else is going to do it. It's not like you have to build this big, big uh, store anymore where you buy a lot of stock and put it in there. You can specialize. One of my favorite stores in Sweden is a store that sells large shoes. I have a size 49. I don't know if you guys have the similar sizing in Brazil. It's, I have 31 centimeter feet, so <laughs> quite big. I can't find shoes in a regular store, but there's a website in Sweden they measure all the, they specialize on big feet, and they measure all the insides of the shoes, and I know that when I order, it will fit my feet. I'm never gonna shop from any of the major retailers anymore because they understand me. They listen to me as a customer, and they provide a service for me. So how do you, how do you transform this into strategy within the organization to, to become fast? Okay, so you're innovative, you're adapting, but you have to do it at the rate of your environment. If your environment, if you have kids swiping the TV and you're a TV manufacturer and you don't have a t TV that swipes, you're going to be dead in a couple of years because those kids are going to grow up and they're going to start buying TVs. For us, it was adding, I mean, we're still in the early stages of this, but adding a UX team, usability team. Austin Knight was here yesterday talking about this, uh, and it was great. If, if you missed it, please look into it because that's, 
where you need to be. We're not there yet, but we started. We have three people working in the UX department. One psychology, uh, he is a psychology major, so he's not even an internet guy. I mean, he has a passion for digital, but he is a psychology major, uh, a front-end developer, and a designer. And I'm going to go into that in a moment, what they're doing. And then we added a retention team because that's CRM, it's newsletters, it's, it's also understanding the inbound marketing. So, so this is what we did to become faster, because conversion, doing A-B tests, listening, looking at the customers, what they're doing, and try to adapt in a fast and, and, and to market, time to market, get it really fast. Oh, I can't use the clicker on this side, so I'm going to go back here. Or maybe not here. No? There we go. Thanks. So this is how we work. And, uh, and uh, it's a bit from Austin Knight's presentation yesterday. It's very similar. It's a cycle. We have an input. We have an idea. We do some uh, testing, real life environmental testing. We have people. We're, first, we're looking at how people are behaving on our website. If we see that they can't find a button or we look at heat maps, we see, OK, the button is not in right. Then we come up with a hypothesis. We trial it with uh, um, eye cam, so, so we have people coming into a lab and we do eye tracking and see, okay, this, that's just one example of how we do it, but they can't find a button, so we have a hypothesis. The button should be a bit bigger. And what we do is we do a sample test, a simple test, A-B test live on the website, give it to 10% or 50% of the visitors, and if the results are positive, time to market. We'll just develop it and launch it on a website. If it doesn't work, it might not be that it's a bad idea. The execution might have been difficult, uh, different. So we look at it, we optimize, we retry, go back into the cycle, and start over again. And if it doesn't work, then we discard it. And it's quite cool, because previously, if we go back five years ago, how we did it, remember? We, we tried one thing in Sweden, it worked there, then we launched it in all the countries. And it took maybe a couple of weeks for it to get developed. Today, we do it like this. We have 10, 15, 20 different tests going on simultaneously. And what works, we grab them up, we develop it. What doesn't work, we discard them easily. We kill all our darlings immediately. So I would like to share a bit a couple of these findings that we thought. So I would ask you all to please stand up, because we're going to do a, a test and see how good you guys are at usability. So we're going to find our next super usability expert in the audience here. All right. So I'm going to show you guys a couple of screenshots, and we're going to see how good you guys are at guessing this. So this is the layout of the uh, Danish homepage. Uh, we wanted to do a test where uh, I'm really sorry for the bad pixelated, because uh, I didn't save a huge screenshot. We only saved small ones. And, I didn't know we were going to use it in Brazil in an e-commerce presentation, but here it is. So the left one, we focused on the products, uh, only products, and, and uh, nothing else. And on the right one, we wanted to focus more on campaigns. This is, it says, save money, new, new, uh, new offerings today, find a perfect birthday gift to her, uh, and then a USB, a guaranteed delivery on Valentine's Day. So all of you who thought, the one on the right side performed better. Please raise your hands. Really good. Now, you who raised your hands, please sit down, because it was the left one. So all of you who did not raise your hands, you can st still stand up. Those who raised your hands, sit down. And this, you guys are e-commerce professionals, so you should be really good at this. So the next thing we tried was a different location of the call to action button. This is a Swedish website. And it says, buy now. So on the left one, and this was kind of, we thought, OK, so how do people, because they le read from left to right. And I'm an uh, advertising major. So I've always learned that you should have the logo on the bottom. This is a classical advertising, bottom right, because people read like that. So we wanted to test. So buy now on the left side, buy now on the right side. So to keep it simple, again, those of you who think the right one performed better, Please raise your hands. You can sit down, you who've raised your hands. <laughs> this one was one of those where the previous CEO, it was one of his big things. He was like, I've talked to this advertising guru, and he's telling us we need to have the buy now button on the right side, because people read from left to right. 
okay, we'll test it, we'll test it. And it performed a lot worse. <laughs> so product description. The left one has an extensive product, product description. The right one doesn't basically have any product description at all. So once again, to keep it uniform, the one who you guys who think the right one, right side performed the best, please raise your hands. You can actually still stand up. So you who didn't raise your hands, please sit down. Oh my god, you guys, are you really working with e-commerce? <laughs> we have one more. Let's see. Maybe it's the batteries. There we go. Uh, actually, we have two more. Uh, buy now or to the product. We tested this in Germany. The left one says buy now, the right one to the product. Watch what works the best. So if you think that to the product, which is on the right side, performed better in Germany, please raise your hand. All right, you can still stand up. You who did not raise your hand, please sit down. This one is fascinating. Germans don't want to get attached that soon. They want to feel if, if they, oh, buy the product? No, 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 I was just browsing. I'm not going to buy a product. And this is the last one, with or without add-ons. So on the left side, no add-ons. On the right side, chocolates, teddy bears, champagne. So we'll get it with the flowers. You who think the one on the right-hand side performed better, please raise your hands. You can sit down, you who raised your hands. All right, so let me count. Before the, the, the guys who are still standing up, let me count you guys, because it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. A big round of hands for you, because you are the usability experts. You can sit down. Thank you. Thank you so much. 12 people out of, I'm guessing, maybe 500? That's, that's worse than if we would have flipped the coin. If we would have flipped a coin, 3% of you would be standing. So it would be, okay, it's not that much worse. It would have been 15, it's a bit more. Uh, and what does this tell us? We don't know anything. We, it's basically, you would have done better guessing than, than trying to figure it out. And with, with 500 people, of course, we're going to have some people standing up. I've done this with this exact one twice in Sweden with 100 people, and all of the times, everyone has been sitting down. And, and you guys work with e-commerce, so, so it should have been even easier for you. I, I, I've done it once in the company, the, in Euroflorist, and I don't have people standing up. And those are people who've worked with this. So the sooner you understand that you don't know anything about the future, the, the easier it will be to you to, to just let go of that, let go of your ego, and okay, what do we need to do to actually cater to the customer, to figure out what they need, and do what they want. So back to the future too. Uh, I put it in there because last year, 2015, October, this is a bit of a nerdy thing, but uh, back to the future too. That's when they actually traveled to the future. So the movie was made in the 1980s. They tried to predict about what the world was going to look like in 30 years from now. And what, a couple of the things, they were actually quite good at this. We didn't have any flying cars, so that's a shame. Uh, people are still using faxes. Nobody uses faxes. Or maybe? I don't know. Uh, but they had uh, smart glasses, augmented reality. They had um, big, big ass, sorry for cursing, <laughs> but uh, uh, thin TVs. Um, they even have hoverboards. Now we have kind of a hoverboard. But we don't have 3D uh, posters. We, there's a lot of things that we don't have. Um, I think they did a pretty good job at predicting the future, but I, for some reason I think Walking Dead or the zombie movies are even better at predicting the future. And you guys will see this in a couple of weeks in Brazil. Right now you have not gotten Pokemon Go. So you, you, you probably read about it, and some people have probably downloaded it and have it, but you will have zombies walking your streets. In Malmö, Sweden, if you go out into the parks, you have, I'm not kidding you, I'm one of those, so I play it. <laughs> so I'm not going to make fun of the people. But walking like this, basically. Uh, huh. So what people couldn't predict 30 years ago was internet and, and how, how big impact it has on our everyday lives. And the cool thing with Pokemon Go, it's not even released worldwide yet, but the time they went to 
I think, was it 400 million users? They did that in a couple of weeks. It took Facebook a couple of years to get to 700 million users. The rate of, of change is so fast. Uh, and so I'm, I'm curious to see how people are going to order uh, deliveries to make other people happy in the future because it might just be, and this is how I would want it, I want some, some smart gadget or some smart to remember when, when my parents or my mom's birthday is or, or, or other important dates. And just when I wake up, like Amazon Echo, it could just ask me, okay, so Laszlo, it's, it's your mother's birthday. Do you want to send her flowers? And I'm like, nah, I'm going to visit her. Or, yeah, I'll send her, but send her a big bouquet because I won't see her. And this is what we need to prepare for. Remember, we don't know anything about this future. So if I would say one of the takeaways I have from these 21 years of e-commerce that we have at Euroflorist is, yeah, you can, be, you can be innovative, you can be fast, or you can be adaptable, but you have to be extremely fast. Because if the environment around you is moving at such a rate, you have to do that. It's really hard to predict. And our next step as a company will then definitely try to be to have a website that instantaneously, dynamically adapts to the customer. If we have a person, a guy coming in there, they, they behave differently. You don't, it's not just Germans to Danes, but within a country, within, within the customers you have, they behave differently. You have a person who immediately picks out a bouquet, puts it in a shopping cart, and wants to pay. They have to go through the same hassle with the purchase process and the cart and adding add-ons and adding this and that as a customer who wants to add add-ons. Why do we do that? Why do we have a website? It, it's like we're still stuck in the, in the way of doing uh, retailing where you have this grocery store and you put the candy in the, in the end of the aisles because that's where people buy and you put the milk in the back because, because you can't physically change a store depending on the customer. But imagine if you had a grocery store where you saw that the customer coming in, okay, it's 9 o'clock on a Friday evening, it's two guys coming in, okay, let's push the beer up front and the chips and the nachos and the dip. And, and, and it's early in the morning, it's a mom coming in, okay, let's put the bread and milk and butter up front. You can't do that, but digitally you can. And that's what we really need to be doing. We need to be not talking about responsive websites that change to your device, but dynamic platforms that change to the customer, the specific customer that's coming in. So that's what I wanted to talk about. So obrigado. Thank you very much. And